Hello and welcome. We'll uh, wait a few more seconds uh, while uh, people are still pouring into the room. <laughs> All right, I think we can start. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, greetings from snowy uh, Pennsylvania. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, wonderful talk on this wonderful book, uh, The Sultan's Communists, uh, Moroccan Jews and the Politics of Belonging uh, that was recently published by Stanford University Press. And we are honored to have with us the author uh, Professor Alma uh, Heckman. Um, before we begin, I want to thank the Department of History and the Jewish Studies Program at Penn State for sponsoring this event. Um, please mark down your calendars for our next talk on February 24th at noon, uh, when we'll host uh, Deborah Starr, uh, the author of Togo Mizrahi uh, and the Making of Egyptian Cinema. Um, and uh, you can follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram um, to find out on future events. And all of our events are recorded and uh, posted on our YouTube channel. So uh, plenty of ways to connect with us. Um, so today we are honored uh, to have with us uh, Alma Rachel Heckman. She is a Newfield Levine Chair of Holocaust Studies and Assistant Professor of History and Jewish Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, where it's not snowy, I think. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she specializes in modern Jewish history of North Africa and the Middle East with an interest in citizenship, political transformation, uh, transnationalism and empire. Her first book is uh, The Sultan's Communists, Moroccan Jews and the Politics of Belonging uh, that was published uh, in 2021. Additionally, she is working on a co-edited uh, volume examining examining Jews in radical political uh, politics and comparative framework. Uh, she has held fellowship with Fulbright, uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and the Katz Center for Advanced Project Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And she has published a work in a number of journals in edited volume. Uh, thank you so much for being our guest today. Alma, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you so much, um, everyone, for being here. And thank you so much to Lior Sternfeld and to Michelle Campos for inviting me to give this talk. And it's definitely not snowy here. I'm a native from Chicago. I've done my time with snow. I've been living in California for about 10 years now, and I don't intend to change that. So the snow is all yours. Um, but let me share my screen. And that should be popping up for all of you now. Okay, so I thought I would start this talk by talking a bit about how I first became interested in this topic because it otherwise seems a little bit esoteric, kind of narrow until you get to know the bigger questions that inform the book. After all, most people, when they hear the title, have never heard of, sometimes people know that there were Jews in Morocco. Um, sometimes people know that there were communists in Morocco, but seldom do people know that both of those circles overlapped. 
And so the way I found out about these overlapping circles was this figure, Simone Levy. I had a Fulbright in Morocco during the academic year 2009, 2010. And when I was there, I had this sort of amorphous project thinking about Jewish sites of memory in Morocco. It wasn't very well informed. It was before I was in grad school. And some of the time I spent volunteering in this museum whose um, sort of front a wall you see pictured on the left hand side of the PowerPoint, the uh, Jewish History Museum, in the Moroccan Jewish History Museum in Casablanca. Um, and I sort of volunteered working in their archives and all sorts of things. And I got to know the director of that museum very well. And the director was this man who you see pictured here, Simon Levy. And over the course of about a year, I had a lot of good conversations with Simon Levy about his life, about his activities. And I came to understand that he had once been a very prominent member of the Moroccan Communist Party. He was one of the few very prominent Jewish members of the Moroccan Communist Party. And until I met him, I had certainly never understood those categories or overlapping categories either. So I began to ask myself, how exceptional was a figure like Simone Levy? Um, how unique, how exceptional, and what kind of broader stories about Moroccan and Jewish history can such ex exceptional figures give us? So that brings me to the book itself, which is the result of about 10 years of inquiry sparked by conversations and interviews that I did with Simone Levy. And it's the result of archival research in Morocco, France, Israel, the United States, and the UK with French, Arabic, Hebrew, Spanish, and English sources. In addition to those more formal archives, I also had access very happily to personal archives, including to Simone Levy's um, personal family papers and benefited from the generosity of so many in the forms of personal papers as well as oral histories. This is the first book to examine Jewish participation in Morocco's anti-colonial movement and the problems of political and social belonging Jews faced not only during colonial rule, but after as well. And today I wanna to talk you through the main narrative arc of the book, as well as its main arguments and interventions. And I look forward very much to your questions. Overall, The Sultan's Communist presents the untold story of Jewish radicals involvement in Morocco's national liberation project. The chapters extend from the beginning of leftist movements and demographic upheavals in the 1920s through the high point of Jewish political activism in the immediate post-World War II period to Morocco's repressive post-independence political history of the 1970s, concluding with a discussion of the 1990s and the Moroccan state's lionization of its Jewish past. This scope, encompassing both the colonial and the Cold War contexts, brings into view the connections between the demographic and ideological shifts within both Morocco's Jewish population and Moroccanized communism, as well as the power of the Moroccan state. As such, this book is simultaneously a history of Moroccan Jewish communists and more broadly, a history of Morocco and its Jews in the 20th century. This book is about a minority within a minority, Jews in the Moroccan Communist Party and how they became the most famous of Moroccan Jews. In short, this is a story of how a small group of people gained prominence, both within Morocco and internationally, in ways that conferred benefits on both parties involved. Unearthing this story sheds light on, first, the very mechanics of colonialism and anti-colonial agitation, second, the history of Zionism in the Middle East and North Africa and its detractors, and third, the formation of a modern nation state out of a colonial legacy and the Jewish role within that process. Fourth and finally, studying Moroccan Jewish communists demonstrates the possibility of Jewish patriotism in the Middle East and North Africa long after independence and regional wars with Israel that contributed to the massive Jewish exodus from so much of the Middle East and North Africa, including Morocco during the 1960s and 1970s. My main arguments are as follows, that the story of Moroccan Jewish communists is both exceptional and emblematic 
of the history of Jews in Morocco and of the history of Moroccan political life across the years of colonial occupation into independence and the Cold War. That the legitimacy of the Mahzen, which is a term in Arabic for the centralized Moroccan state, that the legitimacy of the Mahzen, of Jews as Moroccans, and of the Moroccan Communist Party as quote unquote authentic to the values of quote unquote Moroccanness, all came to support and serve one another. While bolstering their mutual legitimacy, the Mahzen and Jewish communists also proved each other's Moroccan authenticity. As the book's chapters demonstrate, a triangulation of historical contingencies and necessities ultimately enabled both Jewish communists and the Mahzen to combat a legacy of colonial sectarian politics through one another. Each aimed to restore, according to the nationalist narrative, the pre-colonial and pre-Zionist patriotic harmony between Muslims and Jews, loyal subjects of the Sultan turned King, the commander of the faithful and the protector of his proprietary Jews. The book's narrative follows the lives of five prominent Moroccan Jewish communists whose names you see listed here, Leon René Sultan, Edmond Amran and Malé, Abraham Sarfati, Simon Levy, who you've already encountered, and Sion Asidon. And each of these figures' lives maps onto the chronological and thematic um, events mapping onto the, the five chapters of the book as a whole. And I'll be returning to these figures in a little bit, but first I wanna give you some context and background. One of the book's central arguments has to do with a few pre-colonial paradigms governing Jewish life in Morocco and the way in which those paradigms became challenged and ultimately resurrected by both communist Jews and the Moroccan state in the run-up to independence from colonial rule and after. And those paradigms are listed here. First is dhimmi status. Dhimmi literally means protected in Arabic and it refers to the legal status of non-Muslims, um, the so-called people of the book or Ahl al-Kitab under early, the early centuries of Muslim rule onward and the protected status of those people within um, the legal regime of Islam. And in Morocco, Jews were really the only minority, um, the only dhimmi status minority. So talking about the protection of dhimmis. Then we have the romanticized narratives of convivencia. Convivencia you might be familiar with from medieval Spain. It's this sort of golden age nostalgic vision of Al-Andalus or medieval Muslim Spain in which Jews, Muslims and Christians got along together harmoniously. That's a very romanticized image. Um, but this also became one of the ideas, the tropes um, that nationalists resurrected in Morocco, that the convivencia of medieval Al-Andalus had translated directly into Morocco and that convivencia was in the process of being resurrected with a blip in colonial rule. And then finally, the role of the Sultan's Jew. It's a term that Daniel Schrader, the scholar Daniel Schrader first came up with. Um, in his book of the same title, The Sultan's Jew, and it's no accident that my book title is a direct riff on Daniel Schrader's title. He's okay with it in case you were worried. Um, he, is, he was a very important advisor on this project overall. So The Sultan's Jew refers to those Jews who served as go-betweens um, between the Moroccan state, the Mahzen in the early modern period, and um, European diplomatic and mercantile authorities based largely in Essaouira, but in other parts of Morocco as well. And you can see um, Essaouira over here on the map, also known as Mogador. Um, so this trope of Jews as representative of the Sultan's interests abroad and nationally. So those are the few, the tropes that, I, that um, the nationalists pulled upon. Okay. And I can explain this photo more in the Q&A, uh, but it's exemplary. We, you can see um, these are some Jews who are taking shelter in the palaces, Menagerie and Fez in 1912. And the Menagerie includes the lion cages. Um, and this was after the moment of colonial rule being formalized. So the other major disruption that we have to contend with with those paradigms is colonial rule. French and Spanish protectorates as of 1912 that would last until 1956 would fundamentally disrupt these pre-existing paradigms of dhimmi status, the Sultan's Jew and convivencia. 
which followed after institutions like the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which had already begun to act as a wedge between Jews and Muslims in Morocco, and I'll explain the Alliance in a minute. This is part of what I reference in the book's title, The Politics of Belonging. How did Moroccan Jews belong to the Moroccan nation? How did that relationship change over time? And what happens to the sense of a proprietary relationship between the Sultan turned King and his Jews pre and post colonial rule? Contestations over the politics of belonging were at the heart of imperialist incursions in Morocco well before the establishment of the protectorate in 1912. French power, of course, had been growing in Morocco and in North Africa more broadly since the beginning of the 19th century. French Jewish politics and the colonial mission civilisatrice or civilizing mission also extended into Morocco in the work of the Alliance Israelite Universelle long before the formalization of the Protectorate Treaty in 1912. The Alliance Israelite Universelle encouraged the formation of new Jewish subjectivities and inevitably politicized identities. The Alliance itself was a French Jewish philanthropic educational network founded in 1860 to help Jews of the Middle East and North Africa, as well as the European Ottoman lands, quote unquote, regenerate. Regeneration was one byword for the Mission Civilisatrice, the so-called civilizing mission, based on the prevailing European Orientalist and colonial logic that the peoples of Muslim majority lands had somehow stalled or regressed in their development while Europe had advanced. The purported goal of the Mission Civilisatrice was to regenerate the MENA subject into an évolué, an evolved subject, at least according to French standards. The Alliance established its first school in the northern Moroccan city of Tetouan in 1862. And by 1895, the Alliance boasted 70 schools and nearly 17,000 students from Morocco to Iran. But regeneration also often meant deracination. In the process of becoming évolué, in speaking and thinking in French, in becoming entrenched in French history and geography with a sprinkling of Jewish studies, students became divorced from their home languages and home customs. Alliance pupils often found themselves, in the words of Albert Memmi, à cheval sur deux civilisations, straddling two worlds, unable to be fully of the home community of their non-Alliance educated parents or their Muslim neighbors, nor accepted as fully French or European. In a cruel twist of irony, the very organization that was motivated by the zeal of citizenship and emancipation in France made it much more difficult for Jews of the Middle East and North Africa to ultimately be embraced as local or authentic citizens as movements for national independence developed. Fundamentally, French colonial policy and institutions redefined and challenged Jews' relationships to Muslims in the Maghreb which would be significant in developing nationalist platforms and models of patriotic citizenship. This problem of authenticity, Moroccanness, belonging, and legitimacy would come to inform the figures I explore in this book and their political motivations against the backdrop of massive upheaval. Under colonial rule, Many individuals, including colonial officers, Muslims, and Jews themselves, saw Moroccan Jews as complicit with colonization because of institutions like the Alliance, because of the French education that allowed Jews disproportionate access to the French power hierarchy, and of course, the rising tide of anti-Semitism in the interwar period as well as earlier. And Jews really found themselves kind of betwixt and between in many ways. And one of the prominent figures that guides the first chapter is this fellow, Léon René Sultan, who was an Algerian Jew. He was born in Algeria and therefore had French citizenship because of the Crémieux decree of 1870 and migrated to Casablanca to set up a law practice in the 1920s, where he eventually rose to become the secretary general of the Moroccan Communist Party. European communists arrived in Morocco early in the early 20th century for infrastructural opportunities. And Simone Levy's wife, for one thing, Encarnacion Levy, she came, um, her family story is interesting and in connects to those infrastructural opportunities. And I'll digress for a second. 
Encarnacion Levy, uh, with a name like Encarnacion, um, you might guess that she was from a Spanish background. Um, her family were Spanish Protestants that were deeply poor, that were looking for labor opportunities, um, and they found some in colonial North Africa. The family story went that they were trying to get to Latin America, actually but they missed, they were illiterate and couldn't read the boat sign. So ended up on a surprisingly short boat ride from Spain to Algeria um, and then migrated on from Algeria to Morocco. Although I find that story kind of unlikely because I'm guessing somebody would have shouted out the destination of the boat, but that's the family story. Encarnacion Levy's mother, um, while the family was working in the ports of Casablanca and the docks of Casablanca, eventually after having worked first in Algeria, Encarnacion Levy's mother sold horse meat um, for the dock workers in Casablanca and also sold um, peddled socialist propaganda along with the horse meat. So she already came from this family. Um, and she, along with other similar um, Spaniards looking for work opportunities, also Italians, as well as other Europeans and Moroccans moving in from the hinterlands to the city, overlapped in infrastructure projects and canning factories and other industrial opportunities that were springing up in Casablanca and other major cities around Morocco. And Carnacion Levy would eventually marry Simone Levy, who I started the talk with. Jews and Muslims became involved in leftist politics for a number of reasons, but for Jews, it was primarily anti-fascist politics and the overlap of the socialist organizations and communist party with the Moroccan popular front. During the interwar period, Moroccan Jews were drawn to a wide array of political affiliations. It was possible to be simultaneously Zionist, pro-France and a communist. And that's in fact what Leo Vene Sultan was. He was all three of those things. The PCM emerged out of the French Communist Party. The PCM is short for Moroccan Communist Party. The PCM emerged out of the French Communist Party and other leftist groups in Morocco during the interwar period partnered with anti-fascist politics. And anti-fascist activism in response to the Spanish Civil War, as well as the rise of Nazism and its attendant propaganda spurred Moroccan Jews and Muslims to join leftist organizations. These organizations overlapped with the Communist Party of Morocco, essentially a branch of the French Communist Party. And when France fell to Nazi Germany in the summer of 1940, this resulted in a betrayal of the promises of the Alliance and the universalism of France. And the Vichy regime persecution in France and French colonies galvanized Moroccan Jews to start to look for political solutions external to France. Anti-Semitic persecutions of the Vichy period undermined Jewish relations with colonial authorities in both popular perception and among Jews. This period accelerated pre-existing political conditions and stakes. However, pre-war, much the pre-war period was much more fluid, um, wherein somebody like Leon Vene Sultan could be a Zionist, pro-France, and pro-communist. That kind of fluidity was no longer possible in the post-war period. As a result, Moroccan Jews were increasingly galvanized to support political alternatives to France, including Zionism and communism. And the Moroccan Communist Party was the primary avenue for Moroccan Jewish expressions of patriotism and participation in the national liberation movement. And here's the second figure, Edmond Amran El Malay. He was the de facto secretary general of the party when um, Secretary General Aliyata was in exile in the 40s and 50s. And he has this quote from 1949, which speaks to this tendency among Moroccan Jewish communists. He says, we are Moroccans. We are not foreigners as the Zionists would have us believe. We are deeply Moroccan. And he wrote this in the communist newspaper, Espoir or Hope in December, 1949. During the Second World War, the Communist Party of Morocco transformed into the Moroccan Communist Party, becoming an anti-colonial national liberation party with a Muslim leadership and membership majority. In rejecting French colonial rule, Moroccan Jewish communists identified primarily with Moroccanness as the concept evolved into nationalist patriotic identity predicated on a narrative of pre-colonial protection under the Sultan. And with that protection, a legacy of social harmony between Muslims and Jews. 
That model of social harmony in turn drew on romanticized narratives of the convivencia, living together, of Jewish life in medieval Muslim Spain mapped onto modern Morocco. Following the Second World War, Moroccan nationalists, including Jews, took advantage of the relative weakness of France, as well as the newly established United Nations, to fight for freedom from French and Spanish colonial rule established in 1912 and soon to end in 1956. The Sultan became an important symbolic, then active figure during the war, while the mainstream national liberation organization, Istiklal, or Independence, issued its manifesto for independence. The PCM followed suit in short order, and every viable political party supported a vision of Moroccanness bound with the institution of the monarchy. Jewish involvement in the PCM grew out of anti-fascism in the interwar period and became a national liberation movement, a popular front movement into a national liberation movement. One of the reasons why the Moroccan Communist Party appealed to Jews was its universalist and expansive definition of Morocco and Moroccan when most national liberation parties foregrounded an Arabo-Muslim Moroccan national identity. And while the meaning of Moroccanness evolved over time, for Moroccan Jewish communists, it meant embracing Moroccan cultural and national identity formulations to the exclusion of all others. In other words, embracing Moroccanness entailed a commitment to Moroccanize and reject French, Spanish, or Zionist politics as threats to the Moroccan nation and Jews as integral to the nation. It meant a pluralistic Morocco free to develop its full potential and a narrative of pre-colonial Muslim Jewish peaceful coexistence. And nobody supported that narrative more than Simon Levy, who you see a young picture of him here from his National Library card. In fighting for independence through a universalist party that defined Moroccanness broadly, Jews fought to demonstrate their authenticity as Moroccans and their belonging to the Moroccan nation. As a result, they demonstrated the legitimacy of the monarchy as their protector in the figure of the commander of the faithful, the Sultan turned king. While during the late 1950s through the 1990s, prominent Moroccan Jews rejected specific policies of the monarchy and its turn toward authoritarianism, they did not attack the legitimacy of the monarchy itself. They fought for an idealized vision of Morocco while simultaneously the majority of Moroccan Jews left the country. However, as the vast majority of Jews left, Moroccan Jewish communists doubled down on patriotism. But this was a time period of splits within the left and splits among Moroccan Jews in the left, splits among Moroccan Jews as a whole, splits over Moroccan national Cold War policies and Arab nationalism, particularly around the uh, visit of Nasser, Gamal, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser in 1961, which resulted in violence against Jews in Casablanca, um, the sinking of the illegal Zionist immigration ship, the Pisces, and the death of King Mohammed V in short sequential order in 1961, two attempted coups in 1971 and 1972 against King Hassan II, and the 1975 Green March, which has recently come into the news because that is when Morocco officially laid claim to Western Sahara as part of Greater Morocco. And yet, these figures who were marginalized for so much of their lives became emblems of tolerance and heroism in contemporary Morocco. And here I'll show you several photos. Um, here is a declaration. Um, this was in response to, I believe this is in 1956, um, to the war of tripartite aggression or the Suez War, um, when a number of Moroccan Jews, including those on the left who signed this statement, um, wrote simultaneously against um, propaganda that circulated in Morocco that collapsed the categories of Jewishness and Zionism and imputed that all Moroccan Jews were Zionists and they were pushing back against that. 
they were also pushing back against Zionist propaganda at the same time that alarmed Moroccan Jews um, into mass migration movements and urged Moroccan Jews not to pay attention to that propaganda. But increasingly, these kinds of declarations fell on deaf ears. But people like Simon Levy and Encarnacion Levy, his wife, would take these kinds of declarations and push them under the doors of people's homes, push them in people's mailboxes, um, et cetera. And here is Simon Levy. Simon Levy, this he is exemplifies um, one of the major splits in the left. Here is his election poster from 1976, whereas he took a much more accommodationist approach to an increasingly authoritarian regime in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, he was able to operate um, on, in public, basically, as a public figure and a public office. At the same time, this figure, Abraham Serfati, had a totally opposite trajectory, um, whereas Simon Levy supported the Moroccan annexation of Western Sahara. This figure, Abraham Serfati, another prominent um, Jewish member of the Moroccan Communist Party who left the party in the late 1960s to found another further left party, Ila al -Amam. you see that spelled out here. Um, you know, and here's a Jeune Afrique cover saying, he who doesn't play, the, he, those who don't play the game or the game of the Moroccan state, don't kowtow to the Moroccan state. He was imprisoned for nearly 18 years because of his rejection of Moroccan claims to Western Sahara and his support for the Polisario Front. And so these two men are studies and opposites for what happened um, with regard to an accommodationist approach or a rejection of an accommodationist approach in that Abraham Serfati was imprisoned um, much of that time under torture and solitary confinement for his political choices. Whereas Simon Levy, while he was tortured for a separate incident in the mid 1960s, by the 1970s, he became an acceptable public figure. Although both men were much maligned by the wider Moroccan Jewish community. And so Abraham Serfati in particular became the center of a massive international human rights campaign um, from Amnesty International and from a number of different Moroccan, um, Moroccan human rights organizations abroad and some of which located in Morocco. And here is one of those pieces of propaganda from the early 1990s. It says, in the country where the sun is king and women and men disappear in the shadow of the kingdom, Hassan II, king of Morocco, detains one of the longest serving political prisoners in the world since the liberation of Nelson Mandela. So being compared to Nelson Mandela. And it's, it's notable that he became a cause célèbre for these national international human rights organization, but you never see a peep from um, Jewish organizations about Abraham Serfati. He was a political liability for the stability of Moroccan Jews. Um, whereas, um, in, and Hassan II, he's also famous for allowing migration of Moroccan Jews to Israel and welcoming um, Moroccan Jews who had already migrated to Israel to return to the country whenever they wanted. So he became known as the sort of um, champion of Moroccan Jews, whereas he detained this particular Moroccan Jew under the most brutal circumstances. Another figure that's in the book is Sion Asidon. He was the youngest, and he's the only one who's still alive, um, the youngest of these figures. He also rejected the Moroccan claims to Western Sahara, and he was more or less a protege of Abraham Serfati, and they served in prison together. Um, and he became the center also of an international human rights campaign uh, for his liberation. He was liberated well before Abraham Serfati. He was less prominent in the movement. Here's another example of some really brilliant student propaganda. Um, this is from the National Union of Students from Morocco based in Toulouse in France. And I would love to know who the artist was of these if anybody happens to know because they're just so brilliant. Um, this is basically a New Year's calendar from 1979 saying, you know, um, Happy New Year in Morocco. We have these kind of numbers of trials. There are 3,000 who have been in these trials. There are 150 collective centuries of imprisonment. In Morocco, there is more than just sunshine and oranges. And you see that picture of an orange with bars blocking all the students or political detainees trying to get out. 
Um, and this, the orange, of course, has a little sticker. It might be hard to see, but it says Maroc. Um, so it's a, you know, you imagine this as a sticker, you uh, as an orange that's been exported from Morocco, that someone is buying in a French grocery store and underscoring the economics of complicity in um, the detention of these political prisoners and their suffering. Here's an even more kind of on the nose piece of propaganda from these student groups. You know, you see tourism's come, tourists come into Morocco, laborers go out of Morocco. You see um, torture sites, prisons. Um, you know, this is the economy of modern Morocco. And you see a listing of some very prominent political prisoners, including Abraham Serfati and of course, Mehdi Ben Barka, who was um, assassinated, who was kidnapped um, from the streets of Paris in broad daylight and then assassinated. Okay. In the middle of the 1940s, the Moroccan Jewish population reached its peak at approximately 250,000. Of that number, a small but disproportionate percentage were members of the Moroccan Communist Party. The mid late 1940s also represented the height of the PCM's popularity in Morocco, although reliable numbers are harder to establish. Across the sources, the number of party members likely rests somewhere between 500 and the low thousands, although figures for event attendance were often many more times than the basic membership count. Most Moroccan Jews were not very politically active throughout the 20th century. Most Moroccan Muslims were part of political parties other than the PCM, including, particularly in the 1960s and 1970s, organizations more radical than the PCM. Moroccan Jewish communists fought for an idealized Morocco that never quite came to fruition, but it's important to study though, and it sheds light on all parties involved. Moroccan Jewish communists have become some of the nation's most prominent figures, even after death. And you can see that exhibited here on some of these two magazines called Zaman, means time in Arabic. Um, is this prominent Moroccan history magazine that has dedicated, you would think it was just a Jewish magazine from um, about Jewish topics based on the selections I have here. It's not, but they do, de they do devote and have devoted a disproportionate number of issues to Moroccan Jewish historical topics included uh, Moroccan Jewish revolutionaries, which you see on the right hand side. By the time that King Hassan II died in 1999 and his son, King Mohammed VI, ascended the throne, the current king, the most prominent remaining Jews were in the service of the centralized state apparatus known as the Mahzen in Arabic. These figures included the dissidents who were welcomed home from exile, freed from prison and rewarded for their patriotism, becoming the Sultan's Jews and thereby, thereby the emblems of purported Moroccan tolerance of its Jewish minority and of political opposition after decades of repression, including Simon Levy, the death of a symbol you see here. And he certainly was a symbol, Moroccan Jew, anti-Zionist, anti-Islamist and a communist. The elevation of these Moroccan Jewish dissidents allowed the Mahzen to atone for an authoritarian political past while simultaneously highlighting Morocco's exceptionalism in the Middle East and North Africa for its commitment to the Moroccan Jewish past and present. So to conclude, characters like Simon Levy, Abraham Serfati, Edmond Amran and Malé and others illustrate that while the, Mor the, while the Moroccan Jewish communists might have been small in number, their voices speak loudly from the margins. Their voices illuminate the long durée of Moroccan Jewish relations, of state building, and the tensions of Moroccan Jewishness across the 20th century. Through the challenges of colonialism and the question of Moroccan Jewish political belonging, the figures in the Sultan's communists are simultaneously exceptional and emblematic disrupting and nuancing modern Jewish history and modern Middle Eastern and North African history charting the transformation of a pre-modern paradigm of power relations into the present. Theirs is a seemingly paradoxical tale of communist Jewish nationalists in a Muslim monarchy, of continued Jewish life in the Middle East and North Africa after the establishment of Israel and of Moroccan independence. And such stories are needed more than ever to remember the contingent nature of history, the fickleness of political affinities, and that the world of today rests on a prismatic array of past political possibilities. Thank you for your time and attention. That's what I have for you.
Thank you so much uh, for this uh, wonderful talk, Alma. Um, so in the meanwhile, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and until we'll get uh, questions from the from the floor, um, I, have a, I have a question that is perhaps a, a bit of zooming out from your uh, from your argument. You presented uh, the end of World War II, and I'll say 45 to 48 as, as a watershed moment in the ideological affiliations of, of Moroccan Jews. Um, and, and I wonder if communism and Zionism were two of the alternatives, and obviously uh, most of the Moroccan Jews lean towards the Zionist, Zionist option, uh, what was the, the what was the, the appeal of Zionism over communism in this period, but also why the option that existed before the war of multi-hyphenated identity, as you presented it, uh, did not was not sustainable after the war. Yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, so the appeal of Zionism, it's interesting because, I mean, just because most Moroccan Jews ended up leaving Morocco to go to Israel doesn't mean that they were necessarily ideologically Zionist. Um, that's the first thing. Most Moroccan Jews were not particularly politically involved, um, either in the interwar period or after the Second World War period. And that was one of the things that Simone Levy lamented um, so much, that Jews were so apathetic in his view, or just trying to keep their heads down, really, trying to avoid trouble. Um, and that's why he was so delighted during the Western Sahara um, Green March that they finally seemed to be showing some kind of political engagement. Um, but the appeal of Zionism over communism, Zionism had a presence in Morocco since the late 19th century. Um, it was a minority belief there as it was um, elsewhere in the region, elsewhere around the world really, until after the Second World War. Um, but what ended up happening, well, mass migration didn't really start until the 50s and 60s um, until considerable anxiety began to rise about the place of Jews in a future independent nation state. There were moments of violence against Jews, notably in 1948. There was a series of violence against the Jews in the city called Jarada and in Ujda on the eastern border of Morocco with Algeria. There was an influx of propaganda coming both from the French and from Zionist sources that argued that Jews would not be safe in an independent Morocco that, quote unquote, the Arabs would massacre all of the Jews. Um, but beyond those reasons, people had already started moving for family reasons. Um, social networks were another explanatory reason. So maybe one person left out of some kind of conviction but the rest of the family might follow, um, not to be separated from the family. There were also economic opportunities. Uh, most Jews were deeply poor in Morocco and the people that I write about were relatively elite and the Jewish members of the Moroccan Communist Party were relatively elite and wealthy and well educated. Um, they had more to lose by leaving Morocco, um, whereas the vast majority of Moroccan Jews were deeply poor. And so a lot of the immigration agencies made all kinds of promises about um, work opportunities, housing opportunities, all these sorts of advancements availabilities in Israel. So that was another persuasive um, component of it. And then as to why that fluidity of the interwar period disappeared, a lot of that has to do with what changes took place in communism internationally. Um, communism came to be, by the 1950s especially, um, anti-Zionist for the most part, right? A lot of this has to do with Cold War machinations um, dictated from Moscow and um, from the United States. Um, so a lot of that had to do with regional policies, regional changes um, in a way that in the interwar period, it was sustainable. And in the post-war period, it was no longer sustainable. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question. Uh, the Alliance clearly had an impact of dividing Jews 
from Muslims in the lands where it was active. And I've heard many people talk about how useful that was for European colonial powers. Uh, in your understanding, was this wedge of divide and conquer impact a, a conscious desire of either the alliance or non-Jewish colonial bureaucrats, or it, did it just end up end up uh, working out that way? Yeah, I don't think it was intentionally a wedge. Um, and Lior, you should feel free to weigh in on this too, because you investigate the similar phenomenon in Iran. I don't think it was intentionally a wedge. Um, I mean, the idea behind the alliance and this, this is something that perpetually confuses my students. They often think, oh yeah, the alliance was there to prepare Jews for French citizenship, right? And I say, no, no, <laughs> they were actually, despite the methods of their education, um, they were there to try to prepare Jews for citizenship in their home countries, the exact opposite of migrating to France. Um, so they were taught to appreciate France and taught all this French geography and repeating things like nos ancêtres les Gaulois, our ancestors the Gauls, just patently kind of ridiculous. Um, but I don't think, I don't think it was an intentional wedge. I, it's hard to imagine how they couldn't have predicted this kind of thing developing and you do see the alliance change um, in the early 20th century onward, particularly in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you see it start um, developing much more of a local pedagogy, particularly for local languages. So you see the alliance, I mean, it's a problem of teaching Arabic from the early 20th century, people are saying we really should be teaching some Arabic in these schools. And some people say, yeah, you know, if we have time, they barely even taught Hebrew, let alone Arabic. Um, but it became a much more urgent question around the, the movement for national independence. So in short, I think it just kind of ended up working out that way in answer to your question. I'd say that in the Iranian case, Allianz uh, even made it uh, a chief goal maybe to prepare the, the elites of the of the of the country. So mm -hmm. to to let to become sort of a vehicle for social mobility for the Jews uh, to be to be part of the of the Iranian bureaucracy and so on. But thanks. Yeah great. Um, another question what was the Moroccan government reaction to the mass exodus of Jews from Morocco? Do you think it differed from other similar exoduses from countries with historic Jewish communities? Uh, Ethiopia and Iraq, for example? Yeah, it was very different. Um, something that I'm interested in is Moroccan narratives of exceptionalism within the region. Um, and it has one of the things that is exceptional is this question um, that Moroccan, Moroccan state, um, the king, most of all, really <laughs> publicly decried the mass migration of Jews saying, no Jews, this is your home, don't leave, uh, we'll take care of you, we protect you. But at the same time, also making anti-Zionist statements. Um, and this is the slippery problem of collapsing Jewishness and Zionism that we're very well acquainted with even till today, unfortunately, um, that that sort of anti-Zionist statement some Jews interpreted as a warning against all Jews. And there was political violence on the street against Jews collapsing all Jews with Zionists um, that did take place. Um, and so the government officially and the government, both the king and all political parties, all official political parties, were opposed to the mass migration and repeatedly made statements that Jews belong to the state, Jews, this is where your home is, please join us in this national effort, et cetera, et cetera. And there was an organization called the Al-Wifaq or the Accord um, that, was, that the king founded or the prince founded before he became king around 1956. Um, with the goal of Muslim Jewish reconciliation. And maybe some of you know the historian Haim Zafrani, um, who is a prominent Moroccan Jewish historian. He was a leading member of Al-Wifaq and one of the few Jewish elites that was capable to write and read in Arabic. And he taught classical Arabic. And so you see these editions from Al-Wifaq magazine where Haim Zafrani is bending over backwards to demonstrate his authenticity by writing in Arabic. 
um, and writes about, you know, the convivencia and protected status of the Mies, all of those sorts of paradigms that I mentioned earlier. So anyway, the official reaction, I'm, I'm giving long answers and short answers. The, the official reaction was very different from um, a place like Iraq or Egypt, but even in those places, right, there were lots of political parties that said, no, I mean, we, we differentiate between Zionism and Jewishness and Jews have a home in these places, but um, it was at all levels of government in Morocco. Before we move to the next question, just a follow up question on, on, the, on the stand of the Communist Party in Morocco regarding not just Zionism, but more specifically about 1948 and the, because this is something that we see across the region in other communist parties, mm -hmm. that many of the communist leaders in the region, and I'm not sure what was the case in Morocco, were confused by the support of the Soviet Union or like yeah. what were they expected to do after the support of the Soviet Union uh, in the partition plan and, and recognizing Israel right after its establishment. So. Yeah, that was a problem. Um, it was a problem and it was a, you know, there was a sort of similar problem with the Hitler-Stalin pact um, of an earlier generation as well. You know, what are you supposed to do when communism was supposed to be deeply anti-fascist and yet Stalin makes a pact with Hitler? Um, so you see in that historical moment, um, communists, Jewish communists included, bending over backwards to explain why this is a practical policy, but doesn't really represent the, the true ideological content of communism. And it really, I mean, the question of Zionism, I mean, it, it's almost thankful in a way that it resolves that the Soviet Union changed tax um, in the 1950s for the sake of the Jewish communists um, and for communist parties in the region um, because it did present a huge problem. Um, but thankfully it was resolved, but it, it did lead in Morocco and elsewhere to allegations of communist parties being inauthentic to a local national politics. Um, the main National Liberation Party in Morocco, the Istiklal, asserted that the Communist Party was a foreign import. It was a continuity of European colonialism that in no way could it represent the Moroccan national interests. Um, and that kind of problem of the Soviet recognition of the partition plan, supported the partition plan, added fuel to that particular fire. And even after um, the Soviet Union then sort of backtracked on this, it, it still presented a problem. Were there any direct ties? <laughs> Sorry for <laughs> keeping asking, uh, keep asking uh, follow up questions, but was there visible presence of at least influence of the French Communist Party over the Moroccan? So like we see Soviet and French involvement? Yeah, less Soviet, more French. Um, because of the way the Communist Party was founded in Morocco, it was initially a branch of the French Communist Party, and it didn't become its own entity until after the Second World War. So you may have noticed at one point in the talk, I said the Communist Party of Morocco, and then I started talking about the Moroccan Communist Party. <laughs> um, and that's because, you know, anybody who studies communist politics know that these acronyms change around so swiftly, and there are so many internal political debates that happen that you could spend a whole talk just talking about that no nomenclature shift and not go much beyond that. But um, it was originally a branch of the French Communist Party and everything came through France. Um, whereas, but interestingly in Morocco, there was a huge influence of the Spanish communists, which is not true as true elsewhere in the region to a lesser extent in Algeria and Tunisia, but there was a really outsized influence of Spanish communism, particularly with refugees from the Spanish civil war in Morocco. There was a huge, huge influence in local Moroccan um, politics. And it became its own entity after the second world war when it was a band um, in 1939, and then it gets resurrected in 1943 under Léon René Sultan. He becomes the first secretary general of an independent Moroccan communist party. Um, and then it changes names after that to several different times. If you read Arabic, you may have seen on 
um, Simone Levy's election poster that I showed, it did not say Moroccan Communist Party. It said, um, you know, party of progress and socialism, right? Um, because it was banned several different times and then reestablished several different times. And so each time it, it claimed, oh no, we're not, we're not Marxist materialists anymore. See, we're brand new. And then the regime caught wind of it and banned it once again. So they, they came up with new names. Um, but the PPS, the Party of Progress and Socialism is still around and it's still, um, it's still around today. And they were very generous in, in um, my research as well. Great. Um, I think that we have time for one more question. Um, was the access to the Alliance open to all or was Jews, Moroccans, or was it selective? If yes, what was the basis? Um, it was open to all. Um, it was open to all. There were Muslims in the Alliance. Um, there were relatively fewer Muslims in the Alliance schools, but there were definitely Muslims that enrolled. Um, so yeah, it was, it was open. And I see a continuation of this question, what was Abraham Serfati's main issue with Hassan II? Oh, I would say, what is Hassan II's main issue with Abraham Serfati? Um, <laughs> Abraham Serfati, uh, well, for one thing, he, he is an interesting, he, of all of these figures, if you've heard of any of them, he would be the one that you might have heard of before. Um, he became the most famous of the, of the Moroccan Jewish dissidents because of that international human rights campaign. But he really ran afoul. Well, first he ran afoul of the French. He and his sister were both very prominent leftist activists. They were deported from France, uh, from France from to France from Morocco, under the French in 1952 because they, you know, the pretext was that they were Brazilian citizens, despite the fact that they were not. They had never set foot in Brazil, but it has to do with their father having done some work in Brazil at one point in his life. Um, so they were deported, and then Hassan II deported them again. Um, later for also the same reason, um, but that wasn't until the 1990s. Um, Abraham Serfati, he supported the Polisario Front. He supported the Sahrawis, the, the independence group in Western Sahara. Um, he was opposed to the Moroccan annexation of Western Sahara and he you know, if it's possible to roll in one's grave, he is rolling in his grave these days over the recent deal um, between Morocco, the Americans and Israel about the recognition of Western Sahara and the open um, politics now between Morocco and Israel. He was opposed to both of these things. Um, and Sion Asidon, who is the sort of living heir of all of these policies, he has been very vocal in his criticism of, of the Western Sahara deal um, and many, many other Moroccan national figures have been as well, but that was his main problem. And you know, during his trial in 1977, when first Serfati was in hiding and then eventually he was found and he, he, in his trial, he's leading this group of students and he says, long live the Sahrawis, long live independent Western Sahara as he's being kind of carted away from the courtroom into jail. Um, so that, that was Hassan II's main problem with Abraham Serfati. Great. Um, Alma, I want to thank you so much for this talk and conversation. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, as I said, this talk will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, and um, see you soon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.